Okay, I'd like to, to first think about when is the last time you saw an American chestnut tree? Now, you're probably thinking, well, I haven't seen an American chestnut tree. And that is actually a sad and true story. Only some of our most senior people have actually seen American chestnut trees the way they used to be. They used to be one of the most abundant trees in the eastern forests. So if you were to uh, look at this scene behind me of a, a patch of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, one out of four trees would have been American chestnut in this setting. Okay, quite a few trees. Now, the American chestnut was a keystone species, meaning that a lot of other animals and, and wildlife uh, relied on it for their survival. One of the main reasons why it was a keystone species is because of the mast or the nut crop that it produced year after year. It produced a very, very stable nut crop. The um, oak trees, which, which has since replaced the chestnut, do not produce that uh, consistent stable mast as the chestnut did. Now you're thinking nuts, well, maybe that supports things like squirrels. Well, it did support the squirrels. Uh, in fact, when we lost the chestnut, this actual squirrel populations in the forest declined. Okay, but a lot of other animals also relied on chestnut, and all these that I'm showing here. Even uh, some animals that are now extinct that you're hearing about in these talks today, such as the Carolina parakeet. And of course, since everybody else has mentioned it, I'm going to mention the uh, passenger pigeon also. It probably relied on American chestnut. So you think about it, if you want to bring back a species such as the passenger pigeon, what are you bringing it back to? Well, our forests are not the same as they used to be. They used to be predominantly chestnut. So you might want to first bring back the chestnut before you bring back these other species. OK, so what I'm going to try to do at this first part of my talk is to convince you that chestnut is a species worthy of restoration. And I've just shown you right here how important it is to the ecology. And it has many other values also. The American chestnut um, was also very valuable as a nut crop for agriculture. Not only did wildlife like to eat uh, chestnuts, but humans like to eat chestnuts also. Whether you like to eat it roasted or candied or ground it up into a flour where you can make soups or breads, or you can even brew it into beer. And by the way, this is a gluten-free beer for those of you who are like me who can't eat gluten. Okay? Um, so it had a lot of uh, value in that way. Um, it also has very valuable for the wood that it produced. The wood was very straight grain. This was a fast-growing tree, um, so woodworkers liked it. But one of the key things about it was that it was a very rot-resistant wood. And so it could be used in outdoors without rotting. So um, what I always tell people is if chestnut was abundant like it was in the past, all your decks would be made out of chestnut instead of that old pressure-treated stuff that it's made out of now. Uh, in, in fact, uh, all telephone poles would probably be made out of chestnut, and you wouldn't have to treat them with all kinds of chemicals. OK, so it has a very good economic value. But in addition to that, the American chestnut tree is really part of our history and part of our heritage. Okay. You probably can't go to a town without finding a Chestnut Street. Just like you would find an Elm Street or a Maple Street, um, you would always find a Chestnut Street. I particularly like this corner here, the intersection of Chestnut and Powell, for obvious reasons. But this is actually in California. This is way out of the range of the American Chestnut, yet it's still uh, recognized. Um, you've probably seen chestnut mix, mentioned in songs, such as this uh, uh, very familiar song at Christmas time, and it starts off, chestnuts roasting on the open fire. You might have learned this poem in uh, school at some point, uh, where it talks about, under the spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. That is also an American chestnut. So it's really kind of part of our, our natural heritage here in the United States. Now, the American chestnut, was one of the largest trees in the eastern forest before we lost it. Uh, this is a picture from the um, Forest Historical Society um, showing some lumberjacks in a stand of large chestnuts. And you can see how large they are. This next picture is not actually a photograph. It's a painting. Of, and so it's taking a picture of a painting. But I kind of like this because it shows a different form of the chestnut. If you grow this in the open, it actually spreads like that last poem. And um, this one is showing a chestnut harvest. And to kind of give you an idea of how big these trees would get, there's a guy up there knocking chestnut down to the people below. So these trees got quite large. Why don't we have chestnuts today? Well, we don't have them, again, because of what humans have done. 
we have introduced an exotic pathogen from Asia when people will start importing Asian chestnuts to plant in their yards and in their orchards to have a, a close by supply of nuts. When we brought that over, um, the, uh, a fungus that causes chestnut blight moved over with it. Now this fungus is called Cryphonectria parasitica, and it was very happy to come to the United States, as you can see here. This is actual a real plate of the fungus, believe it or not. So it came here, found a host that was totally susceptible to it, and it jumped onto the American chestnut, and within 50 years, spread through the whole range of the chestnut from down south in Georgia to up north into Maine. Okay? And it killed somewhere between three to uh, five billion chestnut trees. Okay? Very, very damaging. Now, when this was happening, people were panicking, of course. Could you imagine driving down the highway and seeing the largest trees on the side of the road all dead? Uh, at least uh, half of them to a quarter of them were all just standing up dead. This is what people were seeing. Uh, so they threw a lot of resources at trying to stop the chestnut blight, but everything failed. And we basically lost the chestnut tree, at least the uh, mature large trees. Chestnut is still surviving today at the roots. So it's not extinct, it's just functionally extinct. Okay, so right now there's actually two programs that are having some success at making a blight-resistant American chestnut tree. There are breeding programs and there's a transgenic program. I am involved with the transgenic program. And I'm going to kind of do a quick comparison of the two. Each of them are viable programs, and each of them probably will have some levels of success. They each have their own um, pros and cons, though. So the breeding program, what they're doing is they're crossing American chestnut to Chinese species of chestnut that are naturally resistant to blight, because that's where the blight comes from. And then they back cross to American to try to regain all the American traits. Okay? When they do this, they end up with a tree that's 1 16th Chinese and, of course, 15 16th American, which sounds really good. And it, it is pretty good. But I want to do a little illustration for you. Let's think of the chestnut and chestnut genome as a book, okay? And let's say that book is uh, filled with words, and the words represent the genes in the chestnut, okay? We know about how many genes are in chestnut, and they would fill about a 180-page book. So if you're 1 16th Chinese, what that means, about 11 pages or close to 3,000 words in that book are from Chinese. Okay, or in Chinese. Now, that might not be important because we have a lot of duplicate gene, genes in the two, but it might be important if this was a, a critical plot line or something like that. And the reason why it's important with Chinese and American chestnut is because Chinese chestnut has actually been bred for thousands of years as an orchard tree. American chestnut is a wild timber type tree. And there's a lot of traits that we don't want from the Chinese chestnut. So the problem here is you got to then breed out all those traits you don't want, all right? That can be done. It just takes a lot, a lot of work, a lot of selection. Let's look at what you do with transgenics. Now, let's follow up that book analogy. I'm going to take one passage out of that book, or one sentence. Uh, it's actually a sentence from Thoreau's Walden. I kind of like that because he really likes chestnuts in that. And um, I'm going to use that as an example. We can put in just a few genes at a time using a natural genetic en engineer called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. This is a bacteria that in the wild moves genes around in plants. So what scientists have done is basically tamed this bacteria so it moves genes in that we want to move in. So what we're doing is we're only moving two to four genes into the tree. So we're not making a big change. We're making a very small change to the tree. And now we don't have to go back and try to get rid of genes that we put in there that we don't really want. Okay, so that's an advantage with transgenics. So where do we get these genes from? Well, we can get them from the same place we get the genes for the breeding program. We can get them from Chinese chestnut species. And we actually are looking at genes from those species. Uh, some from Castania melissima, some from uh, Castania sanguinii. But another powerful thing about transgenics is you can move genes actually from other plants. And I'm going to give you an example of one of those that have given us some success this summer. And that is a gene that comes from wheat. And we like this because this is a gene that you normally eat all the time anyway in the gene product, so it's generally safe. But more importantly is that the way this gene works, it detoxifies the acid that the fungus uses to attack the tree. We know that this fungus 
The only way you can form a canker and kill a tree is to throw oxalic acid at it. If you can remove that, it can no longer form a canker. All right? So what we're basically doing is giving the tree an ability to defend itself against the fungus. The tree is not killing the fungus. It's only defending itself against the fungus. Okay? Now, I want to show you some of our exciting results from this past summer. Uh, this is a, an uh, experiment where we are measuring the size of the canker growth on uh, some American chestnut trees, Chinese chestnut trees, and some of our transgenic ones. This first line represents the growth on an American chestnut tree. The higher that line goes, the bigger the canker, and eventually will girdle the branch, killing everything above it. So that's American chestnut, very susceptible. If you look at Chinese chestnut, has a much smaller canker. We call this a superficial canker. Does not kill the branch. Right? Let's look at our transgenic American chestnut that has um, the oxide oxidase gene. And what's exciting here is it's tracking along with the Chinese chestnut. So we've definitely shown that we can enhance blight resistance using these methods and with this particular gene. Now we're going to uh, do this again this, following, this coming summer because you always have to repeat things in science, but things are looking very good. So let's look at what we have right now. We have American chestnut, which is very susceptible on your uh, left. We have Chinese chestnut, which is more resistant on your right. This tree that I just showed you called the Darling Four tree is approaching the level of resistance of the, American, of the uh, Chinese chestnut. Now what's really exciting is we have some new trees that's coming out of our lab right now for the summer. And these trees make more of this enzyme that detoxifies the acid. Okay? And what we're finding in our preliminary tests, we think these might even be more resistant than the Chinese chestnut. And so this is very exciting for us. Again, we have to test them in the field, which we will be doing over the next few years. Okay, so what do you do once you have a resistant chestnut tree? Okay? One thing, when we make these, we only make a few of them. So they're not going to be very uh, diverse. So we have to try to increase the genetic diversity of these before we put them in a restoration program. And we do that by going to the surviving uh, trees in the field and cross them with our transgenic tree. And we just developed a new method that allows us to produce pollen from either seedlings or from plantlets in less than a year. Typically in the field, it takes three to seven years to get pollen. Okay. So we have a, a method now that we can get pollen in one year, the next year get another group of pollen, and we can outcross it until we get a very diverse group of, of trees. We've actually done this. We've actually produced nuts from these crosses. These nuts have inherited the gene that we put in, which is an important point. And we also now have nuts that we are sending away to some of our colleagues at Oak Ridge Natural Lab to check to make sure the nuts aren't any different than the wild type nuts, and that's important also. Okay, so what do we do next from there? Well, to start a restoration program, one of the cons of uh, using transgenics is that these things are highly regulated. They're regulated by three agencies, the USDA, the EPA, and the FDA. So before we can just release a tree to anybody, we have to get their approval. But once we get their approval, then we can treat it like any other tree and start a restoration program. So, how do we get into a restoration program? Well, the range of the American chestnut is large. There used to be a lot of trees there. You don't just go out like Johnny Appleseed and spread them around. So what I like to think of as uh, restoration has to start at what I like to call restoration foci. These are small areas where you can start to establish a group of trees, and then slowly they'll move out from there. This can be on historic sites, if you want to try to restore a historic site to what it looked like 100 years ago. It could be on private landowners. But what I really like is restoration of mine lands. There's a lot of places in the Appalachia where they mine coal, the uh, mines are done, and they want to return those to the forest. These are primary, uh, very good places to start restoration using chestnut, because there's no trees there to start with. And we don't want to cut down trees that are already there. Now, where do you go from that point? Well, the next point is really coming, gets out of our hands and goes into your hands, okay? This is where the people do the restoration. This is a century-long project. So we need you, we need you, and we need you to help with this, okay? We need you and your children and your grandchildren to bring these trees back, because it's going to take a long time to get back to the over a billion trees in the forest. So if you're interested in helping them with restoration, you can contact the American Chestnut Foundation. I've got the website here, and they are always looking for help. 
So I want to stop there and give thanks to the many colleagues who helped us uh, get to this point in the research. Uh, I didn't do this all myself. It's on the backs of many, many researchers. I'd like to thank you for coming here and just recognize all the supporters over the years. Thank you.